Well, welcome everyone to this webinar this afternoon. Thanks for trusting us and joining us today. I'm Claire Rogers, the Executive Director of OHO. And we're just gonna wait a little minute to let everyone get settled. We're expecting over 150 leaders, senior leaders in the sectors that care for children and the vulnerable. While uh, you're getting settled, I first wanna do an acknowledgement of country to elders past, present and future that we are in the, on their land and we do the work that we do on at their invitation. And we're just very thankful that um, they are willing to partner with us. And I particularly think that today's seminar is very relevant in that context, because we do know that Indigenous children experience very high rates of sexual abuse and neglect. So it is very important to me today personally to do that acknowledgement of country. So in a COVID world, it's tough to get together. This is not our preferred way of doing this, uh, but we have learned that the webinar approach is a great way to get into a really deep and important conversation on things that matter in a time efficient way. So we're gonna be very efficient with your time, but I'm confident you'll leave with a strong sense of how things need to change. And I hope that you'll be feel supported by the end of the webinar to be change agents in your organisations with the goal of making Australia a safer place for children and the vulnerable. Over my career, I've led child-focused and purpose-driven organisations, including World Vision. And nothing, I know that nothing is more important than protecting that mission. Child safety cannot be an add-on if we are truly to deliver on our purpose whether that be education, childcare, welfare, disability, sport or faith, every child needs to be protected. Today, we're really honoured to have Grace Tame with us. I am sure that all of you with me have grown to love and respect deeply what Grace has demonstrated with extraordinary courage, using her voice to push for legal reform and raise public awareness about the impacts of sexual violence. She is, of course, Australian of the Year, but long before that was fulfilling her purpose to support survivors of sexual assault and driving legal change, and uh, in that context, changing Tasmania's gag laws. But now she's focused on more structural change to protect the 4.3 million children living in Australia today. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation with you, Grace. Changing legislation is necessary, but so too is our responsibility within organisations to implement robust and diligent controls to bring that legislation to life. OHO does just that through frequent, regular weekly checks of your people against the working with children checks, registers, teachers, licences, health and disability government registers, you can be confident that everyone in your organisation is safe to be there. So that's why OHO is hosting today's webinar. So let's move now to a chat, Grace. But before we start, I do want to acknowledge, acknowledge that it's a very complicated and complex issue and one that can be hard to talk about. So we'll do that um, as sensitively as we can. Um, but just let me share a little bit of my story. I'm a mum of two kids. I sent them to school, childcare. I had a nanny in my house. They did basketball, dance, a um, little bit of football. He wasn't really into football, actually. Um, but all of those things, trusting and hoping that they'd be safe. I worried about it as a mum, but there wasn't much I could do. We just had to trust. And my kids, to my knowledge, were safe. But Grace, you weren't. Your story captivated all of us and you drew us in from the moment you were allowed to step out and put language around your story, your truth. And now you're on a mission to create massive change across the nation. Grace, what needs to be changed and why is this change so important? Oh, well, thank you for that incredibly generous um, introduction, Claire. Um, first, actually, I'd like to acknowledge that um, I'm zooming in from uh, traditionally Muanina land here in Lutruwita or the island of Tasmania, um, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, 
what needs to change? Well, uh, lots of things. It's it's hard to know where to start actually. And um, as many viewers might be aware, uh, I was involved in the Women's Safety Summit, which took place on Monday and Tuesday of this week. Um, and I was one of um, many people who lent their voices and their expertise to the summit. Um, although I have to disqualify myself, I'm only a lived experience survivor. I don't have, um, you know, any any actual qualifications beyond that. Um, but that's a, you know, that's that's its own sort of specific thing. Um, and many of the experts in the child protection space, many of the academics and I were all sort of in, a, in agreement though, um, that the focus of our resources and our attention, our conversation really needs to be on prevention, um, you know, and that we can address through education, um, teaching kids as early as possible about not only respectful relationships and consent, um, but the reality, the harsh reality of, of what can happen because the sad truth of this life is that evil does exist. It is out there. Um, and as children, especially, we are vulnerable to that. Um, and one of the things that I've identified as being missing from our knowledge as a collective um, is around the insidious behaviours uh, and processes that actually precipitate and underpin things like violence against children and sexual abuse of children. And what I'm talking about there is uh, grooming and coercive control. Those topics are still not talked about often enough, let alone well understood. And unless we do understand those things, um, they're going to be, you know, that they're going to be perpetuated. Um, they're going to be carried out by, by predators because that's, that's how they operate. They, they operate. operate. They operate because that they're able to operate in silence and in secrecy and they capitalise on our confusion and our ignorance. So we need to take away their ignorance by giving the, the knowledge, which is power, back to kids and giving them more credit, I think. Um, you know, because obviously some of these, these um, concepts are very complicated, but I do think that, you know, we can tailor, tailor the messaging so that kids do understand um, some of these things or to give them sort of red flags and things to look out for. Because I, I didn't, you know, speaking from experience, I didn't, I didn't know what to look out for as a kid. And Grace, you've also shared that um, grooming is not re re is it not legislated or it's not no. it's not considered a crime in the same way in each state in Australia. Yeah, so we've got eight different jurisdictions, so nine technically, including the Commonwealth, but the Commonwealth doesn't govern the issue of sexual assault specifically. That's a matter for the states. So there's eight jurisdictions that govern sexual assault. And across those eight jurisdictions, grooming is defined in some, but not in others. Um, but I think more um, concerning is the fact that sexual intercourse has different definitions. Um, also the age of a child is not consistent yeah. and nor is the age of consent to sex. And in fact, in some jurisdictions, you've got children who are able to consent to sex. So they're considered a child, but they're considered um, the age to consent to sex. Now, of course, there are cases where, you know, people age 16, 17 are in consensual relationships with other, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 16, 17 year olds. There are ways, and I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, um, a lawyer, obviously, but um, I do understand. I've, I've worked, I do work with lawyers, um, you know, in what I do in this area. And there are ways to create carve outs um, to stop, um, you know, undue punishment to kids in those sorts of situations. 
Um, but I feel like there's a real issue there that we've got all of this inconsistency and we wonder why we can't um, educate around these things properly. You know, we wonder why we're using milkshakes as a metaphor for consent, um, which is not helpful, yeah. at least in my view, um, you know. And, yeah. and it's interesting, the point you made earlier about um, grooming and educating children. There's a recent study on grooming and, and that children are actually probably more now aware of these things than um, we give you know, that the adults will actually talk about. But there's a study that's just come out of Finland grooming in the eyes of a child. And 62% of the children said they had been contacted online by a person they knew or suspected to have been an adult, at least five years older than them. So they were already picking, somehow picking up the cues. Yeah. And then the majority of the children felt that the conversation had been sexualized from the beginning and uh you know we're even sharing it with each other and going oh look at this and so um you know uh, one of the observations i'd make is that child safety is just as important in an age of covid because the activity moves online rather than being in person yeah and uh you know organizations need to be very wise and careful about that Oh, yeah. And there's a huge responsibility that's on these social media platforms, um, you know, like Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. I personally have never used TikTok, but, you know, all of those social media platforms, um, they've, they have a responsibility um, to, to sort of be more protective um, in those cases because um, I actually just watched a documentary last night that was put together by um, or that was... Um, that ACE, the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation, participated yep. in through their task force Argos, which um, specifically is, um, you know, set up to, to protect kids, to, to actually rescue victims and, and try to destabilise these pedophile networks that exist online. Um, and one of the things that came out that really stood out from that documentary was how, you know, a, a platform like Facebook, for example, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take any responsibility for the for the messenger app and and the communications and and it's on those platforms that kids you know are, are engaging all the time so yeah and they don't post anymore like my kids don't post anything about themselves anymore that's not cool but the mess you're quite right the messaging yeah. element is is huge yeah um you What, I guess what have you learned? And I know you gave me a bit of a hint of this before we came into the session, but what have you learned about Australia's commitment to child safety in your travels? What's good and what needs more attention? Um, oh, well, <laughs> um, it's hard uh, because you would think that this is a, um, a very clear message that you know abusing children is wrong um and that we all need to be behind it and it's not an issue that should be politicized however one of the things that's giving me a lot of cognitive dissonance in my work especially lately um the more that this issue is being profiled through the work that i'm doing and its association with um you know sexual assault in general so beyond the the, the child sexual abuse space and intersexual assault. We, are, we currently have a government who, you know, ha have a proven track record of minimising these things and kicking the can down the road and not wanting to deal with them. And yet, you know, I'm a stubborn optimist and I believe in, you know, we need bipartisan support. But yep. then also... Um, we need to be able to stand up and, and, and speak... Um, to power because it's when we don't do that that it is able to be abused repeatedly um, and I know that I was speaking to you before we logged on um, about you know why I find that so hard coming from um, you know my background where I was abused by a serial pedophile who um, had 
uh, many other victims before me um, in this particular institution where he taught from 1992 until 2011 until I reported him to police and the institution itself knew about his history before I was even born um, you know and he was found with like 28 multimedia files of child abuse material on his computer, including a trophy file of other students who were topless that had to be identified by another teacher at the school. And even in his case, you know, there are still people who sympathise with, with him and they support him. And there are people out there who support the, the other side. And that is not necessarily because those people are coming from a bad place, but it's, you know, a lot of the disbelief I suppose, in society around this issue is actually founded in goodness mm -hmm. uh, because as um, Sonia Ryan, who's the, the mother of Carly Ryan, who was murdered by an online pedophile when she was 17, as Sonia Ryan pointed out, you know, people don't want to believe there is such depravity in the world. And so that's, that's where there's sometimes opposition is because it is, it's just founded in pure good hearted disbelief in yeah. pure evil. Um, and so unless we are confronted with the raw details of, of lived experience, we won't engage. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I do, I do get it. Like I was talking to you before, I, I was <laughs> repeatedly raped by this pedophile and I still catch myself feeling immense guilt because I exposed him I, I reported him to police and mm. thereby ruined his life even though the argument is obviously that he ruined mine you know it's it's, yeah. it's so difficult because we're talking about when we talk about predators we are talking about human beings yeah um you're so right and and I see this in I, my in my day job um where that, that point you're making about we don't like to believe that people with malintent are in our midst. Yeah. Oh, we know George or we know yeah. Mary, right. you know. But um, the, the truth is that I've been given some fascinating excuses for not using OHO and one of them speaks to exactly your point and, so, and an organisation actually said out loud that, oh, all the men in our organisation, they're over 65 and they're not interested in sex. That was a reason for not checking, working with children checks. So, <laughs> you know, we, we don't like to believe and even though, um, even though uh, what, what I love about OHO is that it's agnostic of any one person's opinion about whether someone's okay, yeah. It's, let's check everybody let's just yeah. check everybody yeah. and we'll just check everybody every week and it's part of our process and you know and then when something happens the organization's in a position so oh we're just checking everybody and here we're, we've got to do something now um and and just for the audience uh, I would let you know that I would like to let you know that in the last eight weeks OHO has found four people for organisations that necessitated them taking action. And we have great clients who are really committed to child safety. So this is an issue for every organisation. Wow. That's incredible. It just, it, that's, and then, I, you know, the, I always, I always just make the argument when, when people sort of hesitate or don't, don't, you know, they feel like they don't want to, do things because it's too uncomfortable I just think well the buck stops with kids the buck stops with kids if you, we can't be okay with that we can't be okay with that we can't, they're our future they're if they are they're the future they're the future and not to mention the organizational risks you take by not addressing not addressing this or perhaps I am mentioning it um, you know, there's risks in licenses, there's risks, risks in fees, there's risk, risks in reputation, there's risks in loss of revenue, there's risks in losing insurance cover. It, there's a whole host of risks and, and claims are going up. There was an article in The Age today about a claim and a lawyer saying, this is what we're going to have to get used to. They're going to go up. Um, financial claims for uh, having allowed abuse to take place. And you know what? that's probably appropriate. Yeah, 
yeah the the consequences of of silence and inaction are immeasurable um you know again just to to draw on my own experience i've i've spoken to some of the other um victims of this particular pedophile and you know, um, there was one, well, actually, I shouldn't share their stories, um, because they're not, they're not the mine to share. But just the impacts, you know, they don't, it doesn't stop with the target, it's themselves, it, it the yeah. whole, whole families are affected. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's another and communities. Thing. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. That's another thing to remember as well. It's not just one person. It's not just one child. It's a whole world around that child yeah. that we're trying to protect. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and this is where governments probably, we've got to help them see the different economics here because a little bit of investment in the risk mitigation tools and practices, uh, you know, versus big claims and also social support and impact for social support for victims. Yeah. Um, you know, the economics of the government's providing that support, which is a, a, an entirely appropriate social safety net. But mm -hmm. if you can prevent, as you started the conversation, if we can do better at the prevention, yeah. then that'll pay for the prevention yeah. um, in yeah. the long run. Yeah, and that's that's the problem. You know, we, we are seeing the government provide some funding, but when you actually, the reality is that, a lot of that funding is for a really short period of time. It's for like a three-year chunk, an election cycle, or yeah. it's, um, you know, it's not enough. And so all these services who are actually on the ground are constantly at crisis point. Yeah. And so they can't get any momentum to create change. It looks really good on paper and the government can, you know, they can spin and they can, they can say they have the, they, they can, you know, they have it there to say we've done something and it does, it sounds to us at home, you know, we, we hear things like $4 million or so we go, oh, well, that's a lot of money. I'm going to add $4 million. But when you translate that to actual services, you know, and all the, the welfare, like it's it's not a lot, um, you know, and when, when we think about um, like what's needed to inform kids and, and, and sort of teach in schools, like it's not, it's not enough. Um, you know, and, and it, 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 I've, I feel, again, I'm conflicted because I don't want to be that person who's always complaining, going, ah, you need to do this, you need to do that, because I don't, I don't want to turn people away by being, by being negative. But unless we say these things, you know, they just, it does, it, it gets yeah. pushed down the road. But we have to, uh, what's the phrase? I think I've got it here. I have to, we have to spend our lives building the world we want to live in. Yeah, yeah, and we do. We need to. We need to change the structures. I mean, um, obviously, we we started the conversation by talking about these different definitions, um, but it goes beyond that. You know, you look at. So, for instance, um, you know, we know all know how much language influences perception. So this this pedophile, um, after I reported him to police, and despite the discovery of all this child abuse material on his computer, which you know, it was surely admissible for evidence of this pattern of behaviour, you know, and, and they did, the police I know did interview other victims of his, um, you know, he was still only sentenced to two years and 10 months in jail. And the wording of the offence was maintaining a sexual relationship with a person under the age of 17. Now, in other states at the time, that same offence ha had a completely different name. That same offence was the persistent sexual abuse of a child. Now, those two things sound really different. And one of them reflects the reality of what went on. And another one completely softens the crime and shields the, the, shield the pedophile from the shame and transferred it back to myself, the survivor. Um, and so there are lots of ways that the legal system still drives the victim blaming attitudes and especially yeah. in the case of children you know like we still see in a lot of mainstream culture um the you know the the sort of um relationships with big age gaps we still see that glorified yeah. um, and, and valorized and that's 
that's a that's a problem and it's not so much that there needs to be censorship but there needs to be that understanding that 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 isn't right in the first place we shouldn't be celebrating that we shouldn't be celebrating what is actually abuse like even just terming child pornography child pornography is wrong because pornography can actually be a healthy thing um and you know especially people who are like you know ashamed and they want to say that but adults that adults engaging in pornography that's completely different anything that involves sexual intercourse with a child is abuse it needs called child abuse or child exploitation material you know i'm still just processing that grace because uh that would that have led to your perpetrator having their working with children check card revoked or not? And and you and I had this chat about he actually got another job later. Yeah, no, he didn't get a job. Um, it's well, arguably, he ended up in a situation arguably worse. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, I can, so I can give a little bit more background. So this. Um, after he was released from prison and now he was released on good behavior he didn't actually serve his full sentence he was released after one year and nine months um and then he applied for a federally funded phd scholarship to um the only university here in tasmania utas um and he was awarded the scholarship um but not only that he was initially put into student accommodation now this is a convicted pedophile who's just come yeah. out of prison yeah. and he was he would have been 60 something at the time i mean he was 58 when he abused me so he must have been 61 or 62 and he was put into student accommodation with fresh 17 and 18 year old yeah. undergrads um and during his phd tenure he actually took to Facebook and boasted about um, getting to, uh, I won't use his language because it's actually vulgar and, um, you know, it it, it had to be cut out of like media and stuff because it was so vulgar, but he essentially boasted about how enviable it was and how awesome it was to do the things that he did to a child. Mm. Um, And because the internet is still a very lawless place, at the time, originally, those comments did not constitute a criminal offence, but it wasn't. It was the um, Department of Public, Public Prosecutions here in Tasmania. Um, actually, that didn't that that didn't sit well with them. They thought, no, actually, there's this is criminal this this behaviour, and so we actually set a national precedent. And he was convicted of producing child abuse material during his PhD tenure. But even though he served another four months in jail during that time, he was awarded his doctorate. Mm. So that this culture of enabling and emboldening and, in fact, rewarding perpetrators still exists. Yeah. And that sends a message to the community that, that this is okay. Right. That you behave in that way um, and you will still be supported by the system. Um, whereas survivors, on the other hand, do not have that same experience. In fact, the experience that survivors have often at every level through the court process and beyond, um, it mimics the abuse itself because obviously abuse, you know, especially, and especially as a child, if you are abused, it is characterised by total disempowerment um, and, and a total loss or lack of control. Um, and then... At every stage, you know, whether it's just in the police reporting, like often you have to report to a man alone in a room, yeah. you know, and and they it, they interrogate you and they pull you up and, um, yeah, you know, they neglect to understand that the nature of trauma is that it, um, you, you know, completely. Um, uh, sort of stultifies your language systems and yeah. and, and yeah. your memory and it's not that you are lying it's that it sometimes needs to it needs to be in a different environment that you yeah. need to be able to share it on your own terms and there's just all these other ways that it, it reinforces that dynamic that the survivor is the one who doesn't have the power or the voice yeah. um, and the perpetrator does um, because actually the law that prevented me from speaking that I campaigned against with the incredible Nina Fennell, um, the same restrictions were not put on perpetrators. So the argument that that it was to, supposed to protect survivors of child sexual abuse 
um, from exploitative media actually fell down because it enabled it because perpetrators yeah. by um, typically um, characteristically are manipulative and they will alter the narrative at any given opportunity. Um, so if they're not, they don't have any restrictions on their voice, but ch children do. No. And, and, and this, in this case of this law, um, you know, it wasn't just that they couldn't speak as children, it, even after they turned 18 and, and gave consent, they couldn't speak either. Um, but of, of course, we've overturned that law. It's just that, yeah. like Congratulations. I said, well, the, the, I mean, that was the work of many, many people. I was one yeah. of 16 or 17 survivors in total who actually lent their stories to this cause. Um, and Nina was the one who spearheaded it. And we had yeah. lots of help from the community. But um, I guess my point is that there are still so many examples like that. Um, and, and it's not unless you go through... Um, all of these, all of this legislation from state to state yeah. with fine tooth comb, and you yeah. realize the gaps. little, oh, these little loopholes, you know, yeah. and the fact that it is from state to state. So you've got yeah. eight different jurisdictions with all of these different examples of loopholes. And, and the fact is that perpetrators do capitalize on that. Correct. And, yep. And a really scary thing is that. Um, prior behaviour in other jurisdictions is not admissible as evidence in the current um, jurisdiction if someone is accused of, a, of an offence, um, a sexual assault wow. or abuse of a child. Wow. How scary wow. is that? Wow. I was, speaking to a, I was speaking to a survivor just the other day who, um, you know, is... is, is really struggling because it looks like her case is not going to like it looks like this person who's accused is going to be acquitted because all of these prior con convictions or all of this prior behavior in other states is not admissible as evidence in this case so grace listening to you talk what i'm hearing is if if we got some of those things changed it, a it would change the loopholes but it actually stop people working with children because they wouldn't get a working with children check card in, in Victoria place. in the first place exactly. or in Tasmania or New South Wales or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then, so, so just for our um, listeners, we've now looked into the statistics of how many are revoked and, and think about this in the context of all the legislation gaps and loopholes that Grace has just talked about. We know that one working with children check card is revoked every day in Victoria near enough to three every day in New South Wales. Um, Queensland's just released new statistics, three every day. So if you imagine the law's got lots of gaps here and they're getting away with things like describing it as a relationship as opposed to sexual child sexual abuse, there'll be a lot more cards revoked, which will protect a lot more children. And yeah. I think that's the connection. If we can get this legislation changed, Grace, yeah. it, it will be amazing. It will actually lift the fences yeah. um, and start to protect children. Um, I, I'm conscious we've got lots of questions and things in the chat, Q&A, so maybe we'll, uh, yeah. maybe we'll go there unless the team want to throw questions. Here's one. Um, structured processes like working with children checks only reveal people who've already been caught. That is true. Uh, most people, um, uh, uh, well, what we know is that offenders uh, are rarely a single time offender. They're usually repeat offenders. But the question is, what can organisations do to prevent employment of predators that have not yet been caught and processed through the legal system? Oh, that is a tough question, and I wish there was a, I wish there was a clear, immediate answer to that. Um, I, I, we just, we don't know, do we? Yeah, I don't. Because they're so manipulative, and I think yeah. that's why it's not that we need to be putting the onus on people to, um, you know, to stand up to them and be able to identify them. I think it's that we need to be as much as possible teaching a better way yeah um yeah. 
yeah. I think that's part of it. The other thing is, even though someone might have a working with children check, uh, commonly now people work in multiple organisations. So if there's an offence and it hits the card and you're checking it, you won't have to wait till they've dealt with it in the source organisation. Mm. You'll know much earlier. Yeah. So, um, and you know, we the news cycle comes, but if you read the news cycle, it's probably months later than months or sometimes years later than when the actual offence happened. So um, that that's the first thing I'd say. The second is it comes back to your culture, your um, the symbol, I guess, that you say to your organisation about how important child safety is. And I was talking with a, a large sporting organisation this morning and um, they're starting to look and we want to support them to do this at, at how do they send a message to everybody associated with the organisation that this is really important and that if you speak up, you'll be listened to. Mm. And so uh, some we're talking about lots of different things, but one is a, is a badge on everything every engagement that people have with the organisation that says child safety is important to us. So that there's some of those things can really help make it a normal conversation and a regular conversation in an organisation to, to address. But, yeah. Um, if your school, here's a question. Um, if your school had a working with Children Check, would it have flagged your abuser? I don't know. That's I find I I don't know. I don't know. Hard to answer. Uh, what I would say to support you there, Grace, and then please add is that the 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 systems have been maturing over the last ten years and uh, 10, 15 years, depending on how long they've been around. Victoria's was only started, I think, in two thousand and four, which is not that long ago. For a long time, Victoria didn't have one. Um, so uh, you know it's. It's, they're still maturing, so it's hard to look back in time, but it's certainly the, there's no excuse for not checking it now. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it, it's, really, it's really hard to know um, whether that would have even been enough in this case because I now know because I read the principles uh, the principal at the time's statement to police um, after I reported and made my statement. And there were other teachers because they knew of his past um, uh, abuse uh -huh. of other yeah. students. There were teachers who were there at the time who actually predated this principal. This principal only started in 2003 and I think she wasn't aware. I think she was deliberately, the, I think the board did not tell her about his behaviour, but there were other staff who knew and there were staff who actually caught him stalking me and raised it with the principal and the principal, and this is on record, I've read this, the principal called a lawyer, she consulted a lawyer, um, you know, to, to, to see whether or not this was grooming, this constituted grooming, and the lawyer said yes, but that whether or not it led to sexual misconduct would be hard to prove. So the school principal didn't even follow mandatory reporting protocol and, right. and report it, even though she suspected it, which is the protocol. Yeah. So it's hard to know whether yeah. a working with children card in that case would have even stopped it because they suspected grooming itself. And, and there was covering up. Yeah. And which was is covering up. Which is the other thing, the other reason OHO exists is that, you know, records were covered up in all the case studies in the Royal Commission. In many of the case studies in the Royal Commission, you can see that there were known issues and files and folders and stuff were altered to hide histories. Uh, and OHO doesn't let organisations do that. We carry that record for you. For, for Well, we say 45 years, it's actually in a database that, could be around 400 years if needed. <laughs> um, but but we carry sure. that to stop that manipulation of records or that hiding of, um, of abuse. Uh, yeah. And the, and the other thing I'd just say is, and again, I think I said at the beginning, I've discovered more about this than I ever realised 
I needed to know. <laughs> but um, the law changed and it's changed up and down the eastern seaboard states. It, it, you talk about the victim and, Grace, the responsibility on the victim and the responsibility on the organisation. The law in the Wrongs Act has made it very clear that the onus is now on the organisation to prove that they took adequate care and responsibility to keep children safe. It's no longer the victim. And a lot of organisations haven't got their head around that. And that basically means boards need to be all over this and they need to know that they've got the appropriate checks. The first case study in the Royal Commission was a CEO who had his working with children check revoked and did not tell his board. And in fact, lied and manipulated to his board. So the need for independent, verifiable checking is, you know, it's like a first base. To me, it's, if you haven't got that, it's like putting the kids to bed with the front door locked. You might've checked them when they came in, front door locked, but you've got all the windows open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, where are we? Any more questions? Does anyone want to put one in the chat or am I looking in the wrong? I'm looking in the chat. Let me see what's in the questions. Have you seen good examples of education programs and resources in the area of grooming behaviour for children? Um, I actually am yet to um like actually see any um thus far i know that there are bits here and there on on websites that are specifically you know like australia australia's center to counter child exploitation i know that they have resources available and certain other um you know organizations in that space you know your brave hearts um, and and places like that. The Morecambe Foundation they they tend to have some kind of material, but in terms of actually like actual education models in schools, I haven't seen any. Um, I haven't been in to see any. Um, yeah, I think schools are. I'm on a school board. I think schools are just grappling yeah, with how to new. how to do it. It's very new, but I think there yeah. needs to be, like I said, like I can offer, I can offer sort of one arm of it. But it needs to be a cohesive, um, uh, you know, a cohesive process where we hear the stories of lived experience, but then also the experts and academics lend their, you know, and education educators lend their um, expertise so that so that it's not, um, you know, it doesn't miss anything. Yeah, yeah. There's an interesting, uh, it's an observation, but tending towards a question here around safeguarding children with disabilities. Yeah. You know, and especially where there might be limited cognition or communication challenges, um, yeah. which are additional barriers for yes. enabling children to speak up. And I've also seen this in the Aged Care Royal Commission. There's an assumption that when someone reports, an elderly woman reports that she's been sexually abused, there's just terrible assumptions that she's got dementia or something terrible you know she, she's not she's got her marbles out of whack and and so on so there's this um yeah challenge of how do we hear people's voices who've got those extra challenges and I don't I don't know what the answer is Emily other than I would say there's there's a new um, national disability worker check card coming in for the industry and that you know, verifying these are going to be just as important as working with children checks um, to ensure that our people are safe. And over time, hopefully we'll pick up more and more of those folks and stop them getting into these industries. Um, Grace, I'm just conscious of your time and everyone who's joined on the call. We are so um, privileged to have had your time and have this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Is there anything um, you would like to say to the audience to, um, about how they can support you in your mission? How can they get connected and, and on board? Well, um, I guess a few different ways. Um, number one would just be keep engaged in, in the conversation. 
Um, and, you know, as difficult as it is, um, remember that, you know, nothing is more difficult than the abuse itself um, and that buck, the buck stops with the kids if we don't um, keep this, you know, this, this issue and its profile raised, um, especially now while we still need more change to happen. Um, but beyond that, uh, my partner and I are just in the final stages of setting up our foundation, the Grace Tame Foundation, which um, its sole purpose is the pursuit of structural change in this area to protect kids to actually hopefully one day um, end child exploitation in all forms, you know, child sexual abuse. Um, so keep your eyes and ears open. When we launch the foundation, we'll be we'll be taking donations, um, and and every cent counts. I always say, you know, every signature counts. I like to remind people that contributions, even if they seem insignificant, are like dominoes. They're all catalytic, um, and they can be that yeah that that spark that ignites um, more change. Um, but yeah, beyond that, just just keep having the conversation, keep listening, keep learning, doing research. Um, you know, putting putting pressure on local members, um, you know, and not accepting, um, you know, uh, anything other than actual structural change. That's fantastic. Thanks, Grace. And if anyone listening wants to uh, talk to us about getting protected for your staff and volunteers and contractors, um, you can find us at weareoho.com and we'd love to have a chat with you. Thank you everyone for coming along this afternoon and there's just a little poll there for you to fill in so we can um, stay in touch with you and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this afternoon and I encourage you as Grace has suggested to continue to um, be change agents in this space it's so important. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, no, no.